In this video, we're going to add some interactivity to our dialog form so that our changes actually update the list of contacts here in the background. And we're going to start by replacing the static JSON import with a little hook I have called use contacts. And this is going to give us an object. And one of the properties here is our array of contacts. So let's replace users with contacts. We'll rename this to contact. And if we save that, we can see everything still works. Now let's come down uh, to this user fields component. This contains the actual fields in our form. And I'm just going to rename this to contact fields. This takes in a contact. And we can now get this type directly from my little lib folder here. And uh, last thing, let's update this prop to be contact. So uh, everything looks good. And now that our contacts are coming from this hook, uh, we can use another property from this hook called update contact. This is a function and we can use this to actually persist the data back to the list. But if we look here, uh, we're kind of iterating over the contacts right here. We're going to have some save handlers and some other things going on. So I think at this point, just for clarity, it would be nice if each one of these cards was its own component because then they could handle updating their own contact in a separate space. So uh, let's go ahead and make a contact card. This is going to take in a contact and it's going to return all of this right here. And we'll just render this out contact card. We'll key it by contact.id and we'll pass in the contact. And we can go ahead and type this. And now we can grab this hook, put it right down here and the page doesn't have to worry about any updating. It's just fetching the data and rendering it. Okay, if we look at one of these forms, we can see uh, all the contact fields are right here. We have these three inputs, and then we have our cancel and save buttons right here. So let's go ahead and wrap all of this in a form, and we'll add an on submit handler. This will be a function called handle submit that will define right here. And this should get an event that we can use to work with the data. Now, one little trick uh, to get the type for this event that I like to do is come down to on submit and define the parameter right here because this type comes from uh, React itself and that is what the type of the event is. So we can just copy that, undo that, and then we can come right up here, paste that in and import form event from React. And now we have this typed. Let's make sure this works. We'll go ahead and console log the event, come over here, pop open the inspector. And if we hit save, well, we're actually getting a full page refresh here um, because we need to prevent the default event. So let's do that first event dot prevent default refresh. And there we see our submit event. Now, if we grab the current target property off of the event, which is the form element itself, we can create a new instance of form data. And if we use object from entries, then uh, we should be able to get a JSON object with the data from the form. So let's go ahead and log this. And we see that's empty. And if we come down and look at our fields, we'll see that they have no name. So let's go ahead and add a name property to all these. The first one here is name. And then we want to add the role and the email. So if we save that and then click save, here we see all the data from our form ready to be persisted. So if we call update contact straight from our hook right here, and we take a look at the signature, we see it takes in an ID for the contact and the new attributes. So let's just use the contact ID, which we have access to right from uh, this prop in our car. And then we'll pass in the data as args. And this is an async function. So let's go ahead and await it, which means we want to turn this into an async function just like that. So now let's come back. Let's close the console and just give it a refresh. And John Doe actually has a middle name, starts with W. So let's go ahead and hit enter. And we can see there in the background, uh, this did update. So this is pretty cool. We've wired up our form to update our contact list here. But it would be nice if after the user edits this contact and saves, uh, we could go ahead and programmatically dismiss the dialogue on their behalf. 
And so far, the only way we've seen to actually close the dialog is with this dialog.close button, which we use right here and right here. So how can we programmatically dismiss it at the end of our handle submit function? Well, this is where we need to turn Radix's dialog from an uncontrolled component, where Radix totally manages the internal state into a controlled component, where we use our own React state that controls whether the dialog is showing or not. And that gives us more control and flexibility to be able to programmatically dismiss it at the end of our submit handler. So what does this look like? Well, it's actually pretty easy. I'm going to come up here to the top of our contact card. I'm going to create some new state called open, start off as false. And right down here on dialog.root, I'm going to pass in this state open. And I'm also going to grab on open change, which is another prop here, and we'll pass our setter just like this. So uh, if we save this and we come give this a shot, let's make Jane a senior product manager. Go ahead and save that and then dismiss it. Uh, we'll see that everything is just like it was before. But now after we await our update contact function, we can set open to false. And now if we give John his middle initial here again, and hit save, boom, the dialog is dismissed and our focus is even brought back to the trigger that opened it in the first place. So we still have all these cool accessibility benefits from Radix, but uh, now we're able to programmatically control it because we have turned it into a controlled version of the Radix dialog. So this is pretty neat. We can just actually use the keyboard here and give Jane a middle initial, hit tab. We're gonna demote David here to a junior data analyst and uh, everything is working pretty great. Now, one thing that's a little confusing about this UI right now is when we hit save, we don't get any feedback. So uh, we can see the save operation takes about a second, but we can't tell that anything's happened. Let's go ahead and add some saving UI to our form. And to do that, we're gonna come down to our save button here and add a spinner when it's being saved. So let's come up here and add some new state called saving. We'll start this off as false. And uh, right here at the beginning of our submit function, let's go ahead and set saving to true. And then if we come and find save, we can add some pending UI. And uh, I have a little spinner component right here that we can render. Let's go ahead and hide the URL and open the modal again. And uh, there we can see right there. It looks a little too big, so let's make it height four. And I'm gonna make it absolute and we can make the button here inline flex. And that way we can just use justify center and item center to center it. Now we want the spinner to be opacity zero by default here. And if we can wrap save here in a span uh, and make this opacity zero when we're saving and show the spinner, then we should have a nice little treatment here. And so one thing we could do is to make class name here an expression based on the saving state. But one little trick I like to do these days is to actually wrap all of my form fields and buttons in a field set. Go ahead and set the disabled property of the field equal to the saving state that we just defined and go ahead and throw a group from Tailwind uh, on this parent field set. And this means that we can use group disabled to just target uh, the saving state right here. So when the field set is disabled, we want our save button to be opacity zero. Let's just see if this works. And there we go. We didn't see the save label, but we didn't see the spinner either. And so all that is left is to set the opacity of this back to 100 uh, when the group is disabled, just like that. So now with any luck, if we click save, we're gonna get a spinner and then our modal disappears. And uh, these two classes right here can actually be simplified. Instead of setting it to opacity zero and then opacity 100 when it's disabled, we can just set it to opacity zero whenever the group is enabled. And so if we give this a refresh and check this out, we're gonna have the same thing. So pretty handy little trick here if you've never seen these before, um, this use of group to target a parent state in the DOM. And this just uses the enabled and the disabled uh, pseudo classes here based on that field set element. Nice little trick that saves us from having to add some ternaries here. Okay, let's add a little bit more polish. When we hit save, we can see that the mouse can still trigger this hover state. So when the group is disabled, let's go ahead and add pointer events none to this. 
and that way we don't give the user any feedback uh, when the form is being saved. Let's also dim these fields out just on this div right here when the group is disabled. Let's say uh, make this opacity 50. And the other nice thing about using a field set that is disabled is that it actually disables all of the fields inside of it. So if we come here to Emily and promote her to a senior graphic designer, you can see that my focus uh, left the input here uh, because we can no longer interact with them while the field set is disabled. So our form is looking pretty good, but you might've noticed something funny. If I go ahead and refresh this and we click on John Doe, update him to be John W. Doe. And then we go back to John we're gonna see that his form is still in a saving state. And if we come and just kind of zoom out here, we're gonna see why. This is because our loop is rendering the contact card for each contact, and the contact card contains the saving state right here. And then uh, it renders all of this stuff inside of the content of the dialogue down here. But it actually owns the saving state and this handle submit function. And so even though the content does get unrendered, uh, this particular contact card component never does. And so the state is never reset. Now we could go ahead and set saving back to false here at the end of our handler, but you can imagine in a real production application, um, this kind of form would probably have a lot more React state in it and keeping track with resetting it can kind of be a pain in the butt. And usually in this situation, I just like to rely on unmounting the component and letting it start from scratch every time the user goes to edit uh, one of these cards. So let's do that right now. Let's just take advantage of the fact that we can unmount whatever is inside the dialog content to give it a fresh start. And we'll do that by putting all of this into a new component that we'll call uh, our contact form. And in fact, we already have contact fields here. So let's just go ahead and call this contact form instead. I'm gonna grab uh, this whole form right here. And uh, we're gonna return that. And right here where we used to render the fields, we're just gonna drop in the old HTML. And then right here, we can now render our contact form and we'll pass in the contact just like that. And now we see uh, we want the handle submit and the saving state here inside of the contact form, which is pretty nice. It's a pretty clear uh, place for it. So let's come up here and grab that, the handle submit and the saving and uh, we'll just drop it in right here. And we'll also need uh, this update contact, so we don't need that down there anymore. And the last thing is we need to set open to false uh, from our contact form. But uh, if you'll remember here, the contact card itself owns this open state because it's what's rendering our dialogue and making it a control component. So uh, let's keep this open state as part of this card. I think that makes sense. When we click this, the card should determine whether or not the form is open or not. And so we'll just expose one more prop on our contact form. Let's call it after save. This is gonna be a function, and this is just going to set open to false right here. So if we come right here and expose an after save prop, which is just going to be a function that returns nothing, and we call after save instead of set open to false, we have a little bit of inversion of control going on here and uh, this should work just fine. So if we did all that correctly, uh, let's give it a save, let's refresh and uh, let's make David a junior data analyst again. Sorry, David. Okay, looking good, moment of truth. Let's come back and hit edit. And there we go, the form state is reset. So this is pretty neat. Radix is obviously still doing all the cool stuff for us that we learned about in the first lesson, um, but because everything inside of dialog.content is unmounted from the React tree, any React component state from these components will also get reset. So I really like this um, kind of approach here. We have our little contact form and we don't have to worry about cleaning this up once we dismiss the modal. So uh, this is working just great. Now, before we go, there is one more thing, and a few of you asked about this on the last video, and that is whether Radix supports animations for our dialogue. The answer is yes, and uh, let me show you how it works. I'm gonna come here to my CSS file where I'm importing Tailwind, and I'm gonna define a new CSS animation with keyframes called Dialogue Content Show. And uh, this is just gonna be a simple CSS animation from opacity of zero to opacity of one. Now, if we come back to our page and find our content, uh, we can add an animation with Tailwind using animate 
and then an arbitrary value here. So we'll use dialog content show and we'll make that last 200 milliseconds. And you can see that the animation worked. Let's make it a little bit longer uh, just while we get this working. Just a nice little fade in. And so, uh, yeah, our content is kind of fading in here. But what about when we close the dialog? Can we actually animate it out? Well, if we pop open our inspector here and we find our dialog, we're going to see this handy little data state open attribute that Radix has kind of decorated our dialog content with. And because we're using Tailwind, uh, which supports arbitrary data properties, we can target this data state attribute, whether it's open or closed, to add a mount and an unmount animation. So check this out. Right here where we've added this animate rule, and we can see this is just applying our dialog content show animation. Uh, if we come here and prefix this with an arbitrary data variant that says the state is open, then our dialog will only get this animation uh, when that state is open. And now if we come back to our CSS and we define a hide that goes from one to zero, and then we do exactly the same thing here, but we change this to data state closed and we change show to our new hide animation. Check this out. We have an unmount animation and Radix actually waits for that animation to finish before unmounting our form and the dialog altogether. So this is a really handy built-in feature that Radix supports unmount animations for CSS animations, just keyframes that we've defined right in our project. And uh, now we can bring this down maybe to a more reasonable duration, let's say 200. And we have mount animations and unmount animations. Let's come over here and add a little bit of scaling. We'll go from 95% to one. And then we'll go back from one down to 95%. Add a little bit of scale. That looks pretty nice. And uh, let's actually duplicate these and define an animation for our overlay show and hide. And for this, we'll just make them fade from zero to one and then one back to zero. And uh, this dialog overlay class actually has exactly the same data attributes that the content does. So I'm just gonna grab both of these, paste that in, and uh, let's just change content here and here with overlay to use our new animations. So uh, let's give this a save and check this out. Pretty nice. Let's go ahead and zoom out a little bit here. And uh, this is pretty awesome. We've got a fading overlay. We've got a little bit of scaling going on uh, with our modal. We can still dismiss it uh, with escape. We can dismiss it by clicking outside and we can go ahead and make Ava here a senior UX designer, hit enter. We get the disabled form, the programmatic dismissal, and the unmount animation. So that is how you add interactivity and animation uh, to our custom dialog here. Pretty cool stuff, still pretty easy. Love that all of this is happening all right here. And we've extracted our contact form, uh, really the main contents of our dialog this, that we have now a custom animation with, we have custom styling for, into this own component. So we are ready to go for the last video in this series where we talk about how we are gonna make all of this code here, including the animations, into a reusable modal component that we could share with our team and use elsewhere in our app.